My message today is entitled Daniel and the Sovereign God, Part 11. The subtitle is The Battle for the Beautiful Land. This one is based on Daniel chapter 11. If you're keeping track, you'll know that there's only one more chapter in the book of Daniel. And so next week, we should be finishing this, Lord willing. As many of you have heard, because I've talked about it on numerous occasions, there's a 400-year period of silence in the Bible. It's that period between the times of Malachi, the end of the Old Testament, and Matthew, the beginning of the New Testament. It's about 400 years, and basically during that time, what we say is the prophets and the Bible were silent. And for the most part, that's true. There was no biblically recorded prophet between Malachi and the coming of John the Baptist in, in the book of Matthew, but there's a problem with this idea of the 400 years of silence. First of all, it's this. The world during that time was anything but silent. Right? Empires were rising and falling. Infrastructure was being created. All kinds of amazing things were happening to prepare the way of the Lord. And we'll look at that. While there was no prophet who lived and worked during that time, that silent time that was anything but silent, there was one who lived about a hundred years before that time who recorded prophecies that told what would happen during at least part, if not all, of that time and beyond. His name, not surprisingly, was Daniel. If you think back to Daniel chapter 8, the vision of the ram and the unicorn goat, remember that one? The ram represented the Medo-Persians, the goat represented the Greeks. And that one had a lot of symbolism. Well, the prophecy that we get in chapter 11 deals with the humans, those animals and their horns represented. And once again, the accuracy of the prophecy is uncanny. Now, this is a huge chapter, a lot of verses, with a lot of intricate details. And if I were to go verse by verse through this chapter, it would take hours. So today, I'm just going to hit the highlights. And I invite you to read the whole passage for yourself in the week to come. This will especially be good if you have a study Bible and you read the notes and you see how all this stuff corresponded with what was happening in history. This chapter feels like a history lesson, but it's not just about what happened a long time ago. This message has a lot of things in it that we need to see. We do see history here, but it's not just about that. We see God being sovereign over history. We see God knowing intimately the events that would happen. So if you're watching today and you need assurance that God is in control, I think this message is for you. And if you need to know that God knows it all and nothing surprises him, then you need to know this message is for you. And if you need to know that God has a plan and a purpose and that it will all come to pass and it will work out for your good if you love God and called according to his purpose, then this message is for you. Look at verse 1. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Now the first thing you'll notice if you're reading along in your Bible is there's a parenthesis at the end of that verse, but there's not one at the beginning. In other words, this is a continuation of the last verse of chapter 10. Remember again, the chapter and verse markers were added later on to help people to navigate God's word. These are still the words of the man that Daniel saw in his vision from last week. The man who is likely an angel, but maybe Jesus, is about to return to his fight against the demon prince of Persia. And it's not just on behalf of the Jews. He's also taking his stand to protect Darius, who was instrumental in helping the Jewish people return home. Once again, we see God doing battle on behalf of his people. If you are in Christ, you need to know he does the same for you. Eventually, the Medo-Persian Empire's time will come to an end. But in the meantime, God is seeing to it that his plan continues. And so at this point, God is intervening on behalf of King Darius through the man that Daniel saw in his vision. 
Let's go to verse 2. This is still the man from the vision speaking to Daniel. Now then, I tell you the truth. Stop there. And you might think, well, of course. I mean, if this is Jesus, he would definitely always tell the truth. And if it's one of God's angels, they wouldn't lie either. So why does he say, I tell you the truth? The reason is simple. These events that we're about to read about would have been troubling and scary for Daniel. And when this man says, I tell you the truth, he's saying, this is going to happen. Depend on it. What I say is true. This is what will happen. God's got this, and it will be all right. He's saying this is definite. This is part of God's plan. The rest of verse 2 here says this. Three more kings will arise in Persia, and then a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Now, there's something to be understood here. First of all, there were more than five kings in the Medo-Persian Empire. This idea of three and then a fourth was a Hebrew figure of speech, meaning that there would be several. But when it talks about this fourth king, this king who will stir everyone up against Greece, there's a better than even chance that he is talking about Xerxes. Remember Xerxes from the book of Esther? This would be that same guy. If you were in the study or you listened to the sermons from that series, you will remember that there was a huge banquet that Xerxes had at the beginning of the book. It lasted six months. And this banquet was likely to was likely held, excuse me, to support the attack on Greece. It was a battle that Xerxes lost, and it was likely what put the Medo-Persian Empire on the Greeks' radar. Look at verse 3. Then a mighty king will arise who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. See, verse 3 refers to Alexander the Great, the king of Greece who would eventually overthrow the Medo-Persian Empire. Remember last week when the man in the vision told Daniel he would return to fight against the demon prince of Persia and when he was done with him, the prince of Greece would come? This is now that part of history. Now remember, the Old Testament ends about the time when the Jews start to return to exile and rebuild Jerusalem. It is in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. If you look for when the books were written in order, it, chances are that Ezra and Nehemiah are among the last books of the Old Testament, even though they're not in that order. So in all these verses, all these events, excuse me, that are in this verse will actually happen in the time between Malachi and Matthew, those 400 years of silence that were anything but silent. Remember in the unicorn goat vision, the one horn which represented Alexander the Great was broken off, which means Alexander died. And in its place, four other horns came up. Look at verse 4. After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. Alexander the Great died. I like the height of his empire, most likely from typhoid fever. And four of his generals divided the empire. Those four generals were Ptolemy, and Ptolemy was the one who ruled the land of Egypt and Palestine, which is where Israel is. Seleucus, who ruled Babylon and Syria. Lysimachus, who ruled Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And Antipater, or Antipater, who ruled Macedonia and Greece. We learned about these guys in chapter 8. Now there was all kinds of infighting and intrigue between these generals, especially between Ptolemy and Seleucus, because they were kind of neighbors. It got me thinking. At the time of Alexander, these four generals all worked together, at least to some degree. They worked together to advance the cause of Alexander the Great, this cause to turn the whole world Greek. But with Alexander dead, these guys started to battle for control of their own. I wonder if there's a lesson there for us in the church as well. When we work together for the good of the church 
and for the good of God's kingdom, we can accomplish great things. But if we allow ourselves to get territorial and we start to compete with one another, will we thrive or will we fall apart? Church, the only way it works for us is if we continue to be united behind our king. In the case of our story today, remember what we have. We have a king who rules the area to the south of Israel and a king who rules to the north. And between them is a prime piece of real estate. It's the best, most farmable land in the whole area. Its climate is wonderful for growing food. It's also a land bridge between Africa and Asia and Europe. And all the best, most direct trade routes go through this part of the world. In short, it's the best piece of land there is in that part of the world, and everybody wants to control it. It's what the Bible calls the beautiful land, otherwise known as Israel. And both the Ptolemies and the Seleucids want it, and they want it bad. And so they pretty much battle back and forth over it. Look at verse 5. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. The king of the south is Ptolemy and his dynasty. The king of the north is Seleucus and his dynasty. Now I ask you to remember, Daniel's ministry ends about 536 B.C., give or take. So the latest this could have been written was about them. The events that we're looking at in this chapter start about 252. So what we're seeing here is Daniel recording events that will happen almost 300 years after his ministry ended, 300 years after he died. Look at verse 6. After some years, they will become allies. In other words, there will be an alliance between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance, but she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be betrayed, together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. One of her, from her family line will arise and take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. So, essentially, they battled for a while, and then they formed an alliance, and they had a kind of truce. Now, a lot of times that happened through an arranged marriage, where a daughter of one king would be given in marriage to another king. And I know this is a really foreign idea for us, and yes, ladies, I know it's a terrible idea and terribly unfair, but remember, this is another time. And this is the exact thing that happened just as God said it would. Ptolemy I gave his daughter Berenice in marriage to Antiochus I, the Seleucid king of Syria in an effort to broker a peace deal. Remember, all these people are Greeks. They're all descendants of Alexander's generals. Now, at one point, they were all on the same team. But now here we are. These arranged political marriages were supposed to bring peace. But as it is with most politics, people fail to take all the factors into account. For example, Antiochus, small detail, was already married. He was married to a woman named Laodice. Now, if you remember the book of uh, Revelation where there's the church in Laodicea, the lukewarm church that made God nauseous, Laodicea is named after Laodice. Well, for one reason or another, Laodice objected to her husband's new Ptolemy wife. Surprise, surprise, surprise. So she proceeded to murder Berenice, and the child that she bore to Antiochus, the child Berenice bore to Antiochus, and to most of her entourage that came with her when she came to Antiochus. When Berenice's brother, Ptolemy II, became king, the first thing he did was declare war on the Seleucids, exactly as God foretold through Daniel nearly 300 years before. In the next verses... We see Seleucus II, 
attacking the south, but having to retreat, losing some of his territory. And again, that was just as God foretold. And from there, the kings of the north struggle with each other for control of their own territory, culminating in Antiochus III becoming king. And preparing to do war, to do battle, excuse me, against Ptolemy IV in the Fourth Syrian War. It goes back and forth like that throughout the chapter. It's Antiochus III who eventually gets the beautiful land. He takes it away from the Ptolemies after the Ptolemies ruled it for a hundred years. And when Ptolemy IV dies, there's a battle among the Ptolemies which provides the opportunity for Antiochus III to align himself with Philip of Macedon, Macedonia, part of the Greek Empire, another one of the general's territories, to form a large army to start the Fifth Syrian War. And much of this is seen in verses 11 to 13. Now I know some of you are not big history fans. I know for some of you, your eyes are starting to glass over. But what we're seeing over and over is once again, the Lord knows what will happen before it happens. He knows the end from the beginning and nothing is outside of his control. Look at verse 16. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land and will have the power to destroy it. He will determine to come with might of his entire kingdom and will make an alliance with the king of the south. And he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom, but his plans will not succeed or help him. Then he will turn his attention to the coastlands and will take many of them, but a commander will put an end to his insolence and will turn his insolence back on him. After this, he will turn back toward the fortresses of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. While this was going on around Israel, right? Back in Greece... Their neighbors, the Romans, were starting to rise in power. Remember, the Romans eventually overthrew them, but not yet. And the folks back in Greece are starting to get nervous. And so they call on Antiochus III for help. Now, Antiochus wanted to go and help the Greeks, right? It's their homeland. It's the place where he's from. But he's got a problem. Before he can go and help out the Greeks he would have to make sure the Ptolemies in Egypt were under control so they didn't just sweep up and take the beautiful land again. It was time for another treaty marriage because they always work so well. So he married his daughter Cleopatra, remember her? To Ptolemy V. You see that in verse 17, right? He will determine to come with the might of his entire kingdom and will make an alliance with the king of the south and he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom, but his plan will not succeed or help him. Guys, this is what happened. Remember again, Daniel is not writing a history book. It's history for us. It was the future for him. Daniel is writing about things with great accuracy that would not happen for 300 years. And we who live in the future can see they happen just as God said. Pretty amazing, right? He was trying to secure an alliance, but it was more than that. Cleopatra was supposed to be a spy in his kingdom so that once he came back from Greece, he could defeat the Ptolemies once and for all and take everything. Unfortunately, Cleopatra became devoted to her new husband when Antiochus was in Greece. And Antiochus went there and he was roundly defeated and his army, most of them anyway, were slaughtered and he was humiliated in surrender by the Romans. I know I keep saying this, but Daniel wrote this 300 years before it happened. But if you think that's amazing, look at verse 20. His successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few years, however, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger or in battle. His successor, the one we're talking about here, is Seleucus IV. Now, Seleucus IV's life was pretty peaceful for a while until he decided to send one of his chief officials to Jerusalem to collect some of the excess funds that were being hoarded by enemies of the Seleucids, right? He's trying to knock down a rebellion, essentially. 
Seleucus IV was assassinated by the very man he sent to collect the money, the tax collector they write about in verse 20. And Seleucus was replaced by his brother, whose name comes up many times in this study. It's that forerunner of the Antichrist, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. It's suspected that Antiochus IV may have played a role in his own brother's death so he could take over. Now, I could talk about this stuff all day because it tells how amazing our God is. Antiochus IV Epiphanes' main goal was to turn Jerusalem into a center of Greek culture and to make the Jews Greeks and Greek citizens following the Greek ways, worshiping the Greek gods. Look at verse 21. He will be succeeded, this is Lucas IV, will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when his people feel secure and he will seize it through intrigue. By right, Seleucus' son, Demetrius, should have been king. But he was being held hostage in Rome, get this, as a replacement for Antiochus IV. In other words, intrigue, right? His title was Epiphanes, which means God manifest. But his own subjects called him a similar word, Epimenes, which means madman. And that pretty much defines him. In verse 22, we see Antiochus had the high priest killed. He took power more by intrigue than by battle. The Ptolemies had struggles of their own. All in all, there's a lot of battling back and forth, and Antiochus was gaining more and more power. He even went down to Egypt and conquered it, and he had himself declared king of Egypt for a little while. This is Antiochus IV. Look at verse 25. With a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large and very powerful army, but he will not be able to stand because of the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's provisions will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away, and many will fall in battle. The two kings, with their hearts bent on evil, will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail, because an end will still come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. He will take action against it and return to his own country. By this time, Rome was gaining power, and Egypt appealed to Rome for help, hence the very powerful army in chapter 25, in verse 25. Rome also attacked by sea. And in the process, they left Antiochus humiliated. Now Antiochus was looking for a way to vent his wrath, and Israel was in his crosshairs. Look at verse 30. Ships of the western coastlands will oppose him, and he will lose heart. He will then, he will, then he will turn back and vent his fury against the Holy Covenant. He will return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. In other words, he would show favor to the people who rejected our God in favor of embracing the Greek style of culture and the Greek style of worship. Verse 31. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. See, from there, Antiochus made the Jewish form of worship illegal. Desecrating the temple, banned circumcision, banned the Jewish dietary laws, burned up every copy of the Jewish scriptures they could find, and then they set up an idol. Some say it was an idol of Zeus. Some say it was an idol of Antiochus. I'm not sure he could tell the difference. He set it up in the temple of our God and then burned a pig on the altar, which was the ultimate desecration. Now look at the next few verses. Verse 33. Those who are wise will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive little help and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they will be refined and purified, made spotless until the time of the end. 
for it will come at the appointed time. Does this sound anything to you like revelation? The faith will be, will be persecuted. And yet even in this, God is at work refining and purifying his people. Guys, we need to see this. God knows and God cares. And yes, sometimes God's people suffer at the hands of sinful men. But ultimately, God's justice does not fail. Salvation lies before the faithful. Eternal life lies before the faithful. And the evil will not prosper forever. The chapter ends with a section which my Bible headlines, The King Who Exalts Himself. This is Antiochus IV Epiphanes. This is all about him. In the beginning of his reign, the coins Antiochus mended simply said, of King Antiochus. But it was soon changed to, of King Antiochus, God manifest, victory bringer. Antiochus was the first person to call himself a god on his coins. Victory bringer was another name for the Greek god Zeus. Look at verse 36. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed for that what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but will exalt himself above them all. So he's not just blaspheming our god, but he's even placing himself above his own gods. The Seleucids worshipped Apollo, the Greek sun god. The one desired of women was most likely Adonis, the, the uh, Greek god of love, whose worship was popular among the Greeks in Egypt. The point is here is a man who thinks he is greater than his gods. And I want you to see how dangerous that is. What kind of fool would put himself over his God? Please see this. It happens all the time, not just to megalomaniacs like Antiochus. First of all, all the Bible says, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. How can anyone look at all that God has created and not see evidence of a creator? How can anyone look at a passage like this written nearly three centuries before the events recorded happened and yet predict it with such accuracy? Folks, the only way that's possible is if someone knows how the story ends from the beginning. I don't understand how anybody can see this and deny that there is a God, but that's not the biggest problem. When we see people who don't believe in God, church, that is our cue to get to work. That is our cue to share our faith. That is our mission field. Those people are why we're here. Oh, don't get me wrong. I know they can be aggravating. I know sometimes they love to push our buttons. I know some of them would even love to persecute us and silence us all together. But they are not the biggest threat. They're not. Think about Antiochus. Antiochus is many things, but he's not an atheist. He believed in the Greek gods. He just thought he was better than his gods and knew better than them. Friends, believers who think that way are a far bigger problem for the church. Because here's the thing. They think they know better than God. They see God's word and act as if God got it wrong. Because he doesn't think their way. They think God can only be God if he agrees with us. And as I'm fond of saying, if God can only be God, if he does what you want, he's not God, you are. And friends, we are puny, fragile gods. We serve the creator of all things. We serve a master who loves us, who gave his only son to save us. He does not have to do things our way. As a matter of fact, he shouldn't do things our way. We should submit our wills to him in everything. Otherwise, we run the danger of putting ourselves above God. If only in our minds. We don't change the scripture, guys. The scripture changes us. The passage finishes by talking about how Antiochus honored a god of fortresses and honored gold and silver and precious stones and costly gifts. In other words, he put his faith in the power of man and material things. From here it talks of the battles and his downfall, except for one thing. 
What is known of Antiochus' end is different from what the Bible says here. Look at verse 40. At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots and cavalry and great fleet of ships. He will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans and Cushites in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. Antiochus met his end from disease. And some say he went insane in Persia in 164, just after Judas Maccabeus restored temple worship in 165. Antiochus died in defeat. Could it be that after all this accuracy, calling so many things with such amazing detail that God got it wrong at the end? No. Remember, this is a vision, and it speaks not just to the time of Antiochus, but Daniel 8, 17, and we see it here again in verse 40, reminds us that these visions also speak to the time of the end. Yes, it speaks with incredible accuracy about a man who lived long ago, but remember, Antiochus is also a type for all the rulers who will exalt themselves above God, especially the one who will come in the end times, the Antichrist. So once again, just like all the other visions in this book, we see Daniel foretelling things that happened in our past and things that will happen in our future. In our, here, here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to know. Once again, we see God's knowledge of everything, past, present, and future. This passage that reads like a history lesson of things that have happened in the distant past with amazing accuracy were written 300 years before they happened. Inspired by the God who knew, the same God we worship, the same God we trust, and you can trust him. And while these were hard times, even for believers, do not miss this. They were all part of the plan. We see just a hint of the rise of the Romans here. We see a man trying to turn the whole world Greek, an evil man trying to take God's people from God and make them Greeks. And in the process, he gave the world a unifying language that carried over into the Roman world. And as the Romans took over, they built roads that made, which made travel easier, which made it easier to spread messages with a common language and easier transportation, and then at just the right time, even in the midst of all the pain and oppression, the way was made for the coming of the Savior. Yes, what some meant for evil, God once again used for good. And even the ones who tried to work against him ended up being used to prepare the way. Take courage. No one beats God. Amen.